I don't have a video about a drive shaft yet. It sounds like one big simple part, and for the most part it is, but there are six distinctly different components to it. You've got a pinion flange, drive shafts, carrier bearings, universal joints, a yoke, and a lobro joint. All of these parts are easy to maintain or replace in your garage with the right tools, so I wanted to post a series of videos for the all-wheel drive guys to illustrate what's involved with servicing them. Most of what we have here is pretty worn out, so lucky you, we'll be rebuilding all of it. The most obvious telltale symptom of a problem would be a knocking sound under heavy load that varies in intensity while either accelerating or braking. Let's take a little ride in the car that this drive shaft came from to see what it's doing. What you want to look for is rough or notchy movement. Visible damage is a dead giveaway, but primarily you want all four axes to move smoothly and with even resistance. This one is notchy on one axis. A loose floppy joint is also a bad thing. If the joint flops around, it means the bearing caps aren't tight, and that allows the joint to move laterally and spin off balance. If one axis is tighter than the other, or binding in its travel, it causes vibration through the whole drive shaft as it articulates. That in turn makes the whole car vibrate, and none of that's good for the gears in the transmission, transfer case, or rear end. It also makes for a pretty uncomfortable rod, but U-joints aren't the only parts that can fail. The low row joint is tough as nails so long as the boot is intact and there's clean grease in it. We'll get to that. You've got two carrier bearings which are just pressed onto the shaft. They can fail two different ways. The bearings can fail or the rubber bushing can wear out. Check them to see if the bearings feel gritty and make sure the rubber bushing is centered and crack free. So here are the tools we're going to use for this job. We've got a pair of snap ring pliers and we'll need these to pull the U-joints out. And uh, here are needle nose pliers just to help us along. Sometimes the snap rings like to put up a fight and that's also what the screwdriver's for. You'll see that in a second. Uh, we've got 17 millimeter socket and we use this to press against the U-joint caps using this two jaw puller. And on the bottom side, we use a 32 mil. This is a chrome 32 millimeter socket. No, this is one and three, one and three sixteenths. It's just a big one that I had that happened to fit the size of the flange, so that uh, gave it enough of a footprint and uh, gives it room for the cap to press out. And we have a, I guess this is a nine sixteenths socket. Now the reason why we're using this nine sixteenths, you don't want to have to press directly up against that because you could mushroom the tip and when you mushroom that thing the cap will never go back on and work right you basically will ruin the joint so in order to avoid that you use this piece right here to press those out um, we also have an impact socket uh, this is a three quarter inch up on the end of this thing because that's the same size that's on the top of the tool we use that to uh, compress and decompress the two jaw puller and I got some grease here with the brush so we can lubricate the shaft and not bind up our tool it's important not to do that now when we get the uh, caps to come out of the other end of the u-joint we just grab them with a pair of vice grips or pliers or whatever you might be able to get a good grip on them and wiggle the piece and pull the thing out so you got to have those things handy as well and those are the basic tools you need in order to do a U-joint job. Uh, I know it looks like a lot, but when you see it all come together, you'll realize it's very simple. You'll want to first start by marking everything. As long as you reassemble everything correctly with good parts, in the same order they were balanced in originally, it should be as good as new when you're done. So you'll need to mark it well enough to be able to do that. I'm calling this the B-joint. There's a nut behind this flange that lets us remove the carrier bearing. You'll need to make marks on both shafts and both sides of this flange because if you're replacing the carrier bearing, you'll be separating this into three pieces. The Lubro joint is a bit more complicated, but not if it isn't binding and if the $70 boot is still intact. You can just leave the boot side alone if it checks out, but you still have to separate this thing in order to get to the rear carrier bearing. This comes apart as five major components, and it can get messy because it's filled with grease. The shaft is splined into the center of the low row, and the rear shaft is splined into the cup flange. You'll need to make marks across all of these parts if you don't feel like wasting time and money, except for the carrier bearings, of course. We're calling this one the C-joint.
Make sure you've got a good mark on the inside of the cup flange that aligns with the mark you made on the rear shaft. This is the yoke kit. These things do wear out. Over time, the oil seal inside the transfer case can wear a groove in the yoke, causing it to leak oil. This repair kit comes with a complete U-joint set. When I say complete set, I mean it contains the full set of snap rings that you'll only get when you buy a Mitsubishi U-joint. They're important, and you'll see why in a different video. But for now, I just want to focus on the preparation, tools, and parts. We did a little extra research and found this yoke kit with the U-joint is $45 cheaper than buying the U-joint by itself. You'll need three of them to do the whole drive shaft. Robert said you can just PayPal him all the money you saved yourself by watching this video. Some parts in this job you absolutely have to replace. These are the washers and you probably don't have to replace them, but for around four bucks we can say we did. There's a tapered edge and a flat edge. The tapered edge always faces out. The nuts are parts where replacement is mandatory after removing them. They're 27mm single use lock nuts that won't grab again if you try to reuse them. You absolutely do not want these coming loose while you're driving. Like the washers, there's two of them. You need two of the carrier bearings to do the whole shaft. They're assembled and ready to go. Mitsubishi even did a great job pre-greasing them, but because of that grease, you really want to keep them sealed up in their bags until you're ready to use them. Grease attracts dirt. You're also going to want to replace your rear transfer case seal with your new yoke. Here's where stuff gets expensive. This is the Lobro joint kit. This is just a $70 boot kit. Hopefully you'll never need to replace more than this because the Lobro joint is $230 by itself. The boot kit comes with a 60 gram thing of grease which the service manual is very specific about. They insist that you do not over grease it. It's measured to ensure you don't overflow the joint. The joint comes with new rubber gaskets for the cup and the boot. But there's also something that you need to pay attention to on the boot. They marked it in green to help you notice it. There's an arrow molded above the groove where you're supposed to align the fat part of the band clamp. It's situated out of phase with the air breather port on the inside of the boot so that clamping it down doesn't block it. Grease will also block it, so be careful here. Also included in the box is a special clamp that won't throw off the balance of the drive shaft like a worm gear clamp would. You don't need any special tools to install it, really. Maybe someone makes a tool for it, but a pair of needle nose pliers works just fine. There's also a new snap ring to attach the inner race of the Lobro joint to the B shaft with. So that's everything you need to completely rebuild the drive shaft on any all wheel drive DSM. The only difference in any all wheel drive DSM is the 2G, which has two separate carrier bearing numbers listed here. This process is exactly the same for 2Gs, as well as for 1983 Space Wagons. If you're watching this because you're fixing your space wagon, please speak up.